All right, so we are discussing forward propagation and we understood the overall algorithm, how we arrive at the output. And uh, this is the flow of the entire uh, algorithm. Uh, and let's see what's really going on when we are uh, working with data. So that's okay. Yeah. So the data that we have is usually something like this, like I have x1, y1. And so what, what I do is send it through the neural network and n and get some h of x1. Then I have like x2, y2, so again send through the neural network and get h of x2 and we can have xn, yn, send through some neural network and get this. All right, so how are we getting these h of x's? Well, we are getting them because uh, we have assumed that we have weights, right? And because we have like these, uh, w1, w2, and w3, or if like we have more then it can go on up to L in a more generic format, we can compute something that is known as the in-sample error. And that in-sample error is defined as, it's a function of h, is defined as the average over all n's of h of xn minus the actual values that we have. And of course, I'm defining the regression error. This is, I'm just illustrating with the squared error, but for classification, logistic regression, we know that we have other ways of defining it. And so more generally speaking, I can have my e in of h to be the average of some error term or error function that we have seen before, h, x, n, y, n, right? All right. So all of this is good. This is the in-sample error. Now, if we have the weights, then we can compute all of this, including my e in, and that's all fine. But then this is just half the battle won, because until now, we've been assuming that we know, right, we know these w's, right? And this other half is more crucial, I mean, to find the weights. Now, we need to use the data to find the weights. It's also the other way around. Basically, what we are trying to say is that we need to find weights that minimize my in-sample error, right? So find weights that minimize this E in. Okay, so one of the reasons that we use the sigmoid instead of the sine function uh, was to also get rid of the hard combinatorial problem that the sine function was posing, right? And so, We've said that this like sigmoid is differentiable and then of course we can go ahead and use gradient descent, our old friend, an algorithm that we have seen before to solve this particular problem. And if you remember the, the fundamental idea in gradient descent is to figure out what is the gradient of your error with respect to the weights and take steps in the direction of the negative gradient. Why? Because in every step you are reducing, you're coming closer to that minimum. That, that, that is possible. So let's see, there used to be this update step, if you remember, and that update step, what it does is, like in terms of my weights, is that, let's say I have weights WL for layer L, so go and update them by subtracting uh, some alpha times the uh, derivative of E in with respect to my weights. All right, what is this? This was some learning rate, an input parameter, of course. And this is like the derivative of my E in with respect to my W. And W was the weight matrix in layer L. Now, how do we calculate this, del this uh, derivative? Well, we have defined E in, right? And so we have to take the entire sum of, the gradient of its sum, essentially, to get what we are trying to uh, calculate. Right, so n equals one up to n. The this all stays the same it is, but here we have to do e, which is a function of h of x n and y n. The numerator here, this one, is telling me how much does the error change if I change the weights, and then this is like the change in weights, the denominator, right? So now. 
in summary, and let me write it down. In summary, we have a way to compute the output, right? So we can uh, compute output somehow, right? Um, that gives us like a way to compute this E in, but then we needed the weights by fitting the data. And we do that by measuring a change in, in E in with respect to the change in weights and run gradient descent essentially. Well, all of that seems fine, right? So like obviously we're not doing computing output directly, but we do that uh, by getting the weights or fitting the data. So getting weights, which is equivalent to like fitting the data, right? And, and yes, but in practice, so now we are also considering some uh, issues with efficiency because in practice, we have these massive networks where efficiency is a big issue because we have like this so much amount of data and you can imagine the number of like nodes and the number of computations that are associated with each one of them. So let's like think a little bit about them as well. For example, if we have like, let's say N data points, right? And the neural network will have like WL for every layers and, and think about that each layer has like uh, D1, D2, and then DL, uh, whatever dimensions. So how many like number of entries do we need like in every layer or, or like what is this bigger picture of all the number of entries or the number of weights that we need? So maybe I can write it down in practice. Okay, so in practice, if we are counting the number of weights or the number of parameters, because this is the number of parameters of my model that I need to somehow get by fitting in the data, right? So these can be specified by adding up these WLs, right? So maybe W1 plus W2 plus and so on up to WL, right? And then also let's specify the number of nodes by this V. So this is like the number of nodes. Where, why are the, these important? Because the computation of my theta takes place at uh, each of these nodes. So now to compute E in, now going back to E in, how many computations, the question arises like how many computations do we need? How many computations? All right, let's think about it. Now each weight is used at least once for one uh, set of inputs, right? So the number of multiplications is equal to the number of parameters, which is my W, right? So then that's that, first of all. And then the number of theta computations is equal to the number of nodes, uh, which is my uh, number of nodes. Let me write them down here. And then that's my number of computations. And for E in, uh, essentially we, we need to compute H of X first. And that depends on my data as well. And so I'll have like the number of inputs that I have multiplied by the weights because then I do the multiplication there plus this n will also be multiplied by the number of nodes because I'm also doing the theta computation, right? Sometimes this computation is really, really expensive, especially when we're using a uh, tan h function, which is not as efficient. It's not as uh, like it's not fast as compared to other functions that are available. And then there is this whole set of literature on uh, these functions. For example, piecewise linears, uh, linear ones are faster to compute. And, and there is a whole choice of these activation uh, functions essentially. So I'm not getting into that, but of course we can, the choice of that also impacts how efficient my uh, computation is. Uh, well, regardless, let's say theta is some like generic uh, sort of thing. At least we need these many, right? And like even digging deeper into that, what exactly is going in when I'm, I'm doing something like for any weight W, I, J for layer L, I'm doing a computation of E in with respect to this weight, which means I'm doing this calculation or this computation, right? For this particular weight, W, I, J, that's what we said, like we are trying to figure out the change in my EN with respect to the change in, in, in weights. And so I have to consider each and every one. And maybe, maybe if you're using this like approximation, which is a well-known approximation um, when we are doing differential calculus, right? And so if we are using this approximation even, and this is just to kind of get an idea of how many computations we would require, 
so I'll have to still be calculating, I'll still be calculating some like delta, right? Uh, what we do is we try to do some kind of sensitivity here when we are trying to calculate the uh, the the derivative, right? That's the definition, that's the basic definition of a derivative. And so that's almost, almost equal to, this is an approximation of our derivative. And why I'm doing that is so that we understand what's going on. Um, this minus this delta, this delta is nothing but some tolerance and we get to choose the tolerance, if you remember, over 2h or delta, whatever that is. Let's not get h here because you might get confused with my original h. Well, anyways, so what exactly is happening here? This like in, in these expression, and in, in like in, in both of these expressions, E in computed with this, E in computed with this, what I'm trying to do is I'm doing some kind of a sensitivity analysis where I'm perturbing the weights a little bit by changing, by, like uh, by giving them a change of like some delta or some tolerance, right? And then checking how much they change. And that's essentially what my derivative is. This is like an approximation or sometimes also known as the numerical derivative, right? And so I, I can get like what exactly is the derivative of E in with respect to my Wij. Okay, so why are we like so much interested in this? Well, just to see the order uh, like of, of the runtime or the order of like how many computations we need when we are computing E in only for this weight, right? And so you can tell just by looking at this and you can go ahead and, and do further investigation is that the number of computations that you will need for this particular expression is going to be n and the w plus n v times this weight as well. It is going to be of the order this much, these many computations. So if like I have 1 million parameters, which is not something unusual these days, you can imagine the amount of data you require because you require at least that that many like data points, that many ends, right? And for this like single gradient computation in, in, in that scenario, you will need 10 to the 18th computation because you require n to be of the order of like w. And so next, like we are still not done after all those computations. So we'll have to do something else, which is gradient descent, right? Meaning we'll have to do this computation as many times and then eventually get the final result. So now all of this is like really overwhelming, I would say. This is not a very efficient way of computing the gradient. Uh, and, and we need to come up with a technique that computes the gradient in, in like an, a more efficient way. And basically in a single step, I should be able to do like something with my E in. So maybe can we remove some things here, some terms here and, and make it more efficient? A short answer to that question is yes, we will do that. And there is this dynamic programming algorithm that we're going to implement that's known as backpropagation that will allow us to, to get the gradient in a more efficient way, which doesn't seem the case as of now. So in the next video, let's talk about that, how to efficiently uh, solve this problem.